Hey, welcome back. Today is a good day because every brew day is a good day. Um, we get to do a complete uh, start to finish brew day with the Brewzilla. So I'm also gonna give you an overview of how to put this thing together. Um, but let me start by kind of telling you about this. This is an all-in-one uh, all grain brewing system and it has an internal pump for recirculating or transferring. This particular version is the 17 gallon or 65 liter 220 uh, setup. And so it can do 10 gallon batches off of uh, 220 power. There are smaller ones that it does, uh, so the 35 liter version, and that is for five gallon batches. Um, I can also do five gallon batches in this, but because I do 10 gallon batches generally, this was the right tool for me. Um, so the user interface up here is very straightforward. Um, you can actually program it to do step mashes. So throughout the mash, you can tell it, hey, I want 30 minutes at 130 degrees and then bump that up to 140 and bump it up then. I just do it manual because I stay out uh, for my brew days, but you can program it uh, to that extent. Um, this also, it has three individually selectable elements underneath. And so one of the things that I like the most about this is this setup. So um, say for a boil, the way that I dial in the boil vigor is by choosing which one, or if I wanna go from mash temp to boil or from strike or from the, the starting water to mash, I just go full bore and I turn all three on. Um, but then once I'm at a boil, I can just turn off, say the 2000 watt and the 500 watt, and I just run it with the 1000 watt. So anyway, that gives me uh, control over that. The built-in pump is really nice. The switch is on the side. You don't need extra 110 cords, which my other systems do. Um, so we're gonna get, uh, I'm gonna show you how to basically put this thing together. Um, we're gonna start with an empty and clean kettle. So this is what it looks like on the inside. It is a flat steel bottom, so you don't have to clean the heating elements, which is actually a pretty big pain in the butt for the other ones. Um, they kind of get like calcification on them over time and you need to, you know, deep clean them. Uh, this simply doesn't have that. There's no roasting or charring on the bottom that's gonna happen. Um, that also means that you're not gonna get a hot pellet stuck inside the, the heating element because it physically, that can't happen. So, um, that's a really good part of this. So we have the main system and the first thing that goes in is a false bottom. So this is gonna keep the hop debris, um, the grains have their own thing and I'm gonna show you that in a second, but essentially during the boil, this stays in. And so this is a um, the main line of defense of keeping stuff out of your pump during recirculation. So. If your elements are on, um, you have to have this on and you're supposed to have recirculation on as well. So I'm gonna install this real quick and just show you what it looks like. Basically, it's just gonna slide right into the bottom, turn it down and put it on. So that's it. It goes right into the bottom and uh, that's what that looks like. Next step, we have the malt pipe. So the malt pipe comes like this. It basically has its own false bottom that you install the first time. Uh, that does come out, and uh, this is where the grains are going to live during the match. So this slides in. It's got these feet that are gonna rest on these outer edge, uh, the bar right here. Um, so that's when you are ready to drain the, the wort out of your mash. Um, and then you've got an, overho an overflow pipe going right down the middle. Um, so this just slides right in. Next, you've got your, I guess your dog bone or the handle. Uh, this slides into these holes on the malt pipe. This is for carrying, lifting, um, suspending when you're draining, doing things like that. So you could use this in conjunction with the winch if you're uncomfortable lifting up that grain bill. So that being said, 
Uh, today we're gonna use this for a porter recipe that has a pretty large grain bill. So we're gonna put this to the test and see if we can do um, essentially, what, it'll be like 25 pounds of grain. It's gonna be a huge grain bill. Uh, and we're gonna put this thing, test it to its limits. Once the malt pipe is in, um, this is essentially all we, all we do is cover that overflow pipe like so with just a little rubber stopper. That's gonna keep um, grains when I dough in from getting down in between this malt pipe and the false bottom. So suppose I've uh, mashed in, so the, the, all the grains are in here, I've stirred it up and everybody, everything is happy. Um, I've selected my temperature and I begin the recirculation. That's where this guy comes in. So um, there is an optional top screen that you can lay right on top of the grains. I don't usually do that. I don't think that it's necessary, but it is an extra line of defense uh, to get the grain husks or anything out. So um, you can use it if you want to. Essentially, this just goes right over that, uh, the grain bed, and you can lay it there. One thing I do use this for is once I'm done mashing and my uh, basket is resting on the top, I'll put this guy on and push down on the grains to help it drain faster. So you do have access to this, it comes with it. Uh, I generally don't use it for anything other than um, after the mash to kind of compress that and get all the, all the good stuff out. This is your recirculation arm. So during the mash, you install the regular glass lid that has two handles and put this guy on with its cam locks. And this utilizes the pump. So you just go right into the top and it's gonna recirculate that wort as we go. You're gonna to get to see it with the porter that we're about to make. Um, so recirculation is done after one hour. You're gonna remove this. At this point, we will add the dog bone or the wishbone, lift, Compress, drain, remove, and then it's time for the boil. So exactly like the other kettles that you've watched, I'm just gonna hit all three elements, turn the temperature up to 212, and uh, let her rip. This is a fast system, just like the V1. Um, I'm always impressed, and switching to 220 was a huge step up in my brewing. I am fully aware that it is not um, available to everybody, but if you have access to 220, trust me, gonna make your brew days go a lot faster. Um, that being said, there are other smaller versions of this. You might see them on the market as a robo brew or um, mash and boil. That's the older versions of this. Um, and the 110 versions are just as good. There is one, um, you know, it's just a consideration of, you know, how fast do I wanna go from one temperature to the, to the next. All right, so my final thoughts on this, uh, and one of my um, pet favorite things about this system is that it does have these clamps for you to set on a lid. Now, it's up to you to figure out where you wanna tow the line on this, but you can get a stainless steel lid with a distilling column, and that fits right on top as well, and uh, you cinch these down and essentially you've just turned this thing into a still. You can make your own spirits at home or wink, wink, you're just making hand sanitizer, right? So uh, that is one of the cool things about this system. And uh, I think that's about it. We've covered everything that we need to and let's get into brew day. All right, let's get right into the recipe for this porter. Um, I ordered two of the uh, Heretic Brewing Shallow Grave Porter clone kit from uh, Morebeard. And essentially, we are going to really push the limits of this system because this is a uh, big grain bill for it. So the, the secret sauce in a porter is the dark malts. And so we're gonna have uh, let's see, 13, 26 pounds of base malts, and that is a two-row and some Munich malt. 
And then the, the specialties is where it's gonna come in. And so um, over here we have some C40, that's two pounds of C40, but then it's the black patent malt um, and the chocolate malt that are gonna give this beer like a, a really dark black look. And uh, it's a gorgeous beer, perfect uh, sitting by the fire around Christmas time. And so we're gonna go ahead and get it. I'm gonna start with getting 10 gallons of strike water and I'm gonna get, get those heating up. And so to do that today, I'm just gonna use the RV filter. Um, I don't feel the need to build this up from reverse osmosis because of how strong uh, the flavor of this porter actually is. So it's a fantastic recipe and I love brewing it. So let's get to it. 10 gallons of strike water coming right up. All right, so I've collected the 10 gallons of water. That's my strike water. Uh, eventually, we're gonna add probably three more gallons, but I'm gonna make that call once we look at the gravity after we've pulled the grains out of the mash. So right now, my next step is to set the temperature for this, and the instructions say uh, recommend 152, so that's exactly what we're gonna do. This system, you uh, it's absolutely straightforward. You hit temperature, select the temperature that you want, and that's it. Now I'm just gonna hit play. You're gonna see the numbers scroll across the bottom. Bruzilla is on, and now it's up to me to turn on the elements. I'm gonna go with all three. So these are on, that means that my uh, three elements are active. I'm going full bore because I wanna to get to strike temperature as fast as possible. Um, let me tell you about the recipe. So in the kits, uh, you have, here's the grain bill. So as we said, it's gonna be about 30 pounds of grain, not, not about, it's gonna be exactly 30 pounds of grain. Um, that's why I didn't do a full batch of water in here because I don't know that I can fit 30 pounds of grain into that malt pipe without overflowing the system. So I put 10 in, I have three reserved on the side uh, and we're gonna do that. The specialty grains came pre-milled, so I didn't need to do that but I did put the base malts, the Munich malt and two row through my mill before we started shooting. Um, so now is a waiting game. I'm gonna pop the lid on this to help conserve some of that heat. And we'll be right back when we're at 152 degrees. All right, we are about half a beer in and up to mash temp at 152. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you the rest of the uh, mashing in process. As a reminder, we have our false bottom in the bottom and Above that, we're gonna install the malt pipe. So the feet, you just angle to fit in between the slots. Drop that bad boy in. We have our plug on top of the overflow pipe. And now I'm just gonna mash in. So I'm gonna put about half of the base malts, stir that in, uh, put my specialty malts, and then the rest of the base malts for no other reason than I wanted it incorporated, but I'll be sitting here stirring the whole time where we go, so uh, there's no real magic to that. You just pour them in. All right, there we go. Nice and dusty in here. So the flavor and the aroma in here really pop as soon as you get the chocolate and dark malts in. Um, these are absolutely wonderful. This mash is gonna smell fantastic. In the room, Immediately, you get like a coffee, dark chocolate. Um, it's like when you first grind that coffee in the morning, this is exactly what that smells like. It's wonderful, makes my day.
but this is thick. I just didn't want to overwhelm the system. All right, so just as I thought, this is a super thick mash, um, which is fine. It's just, it's a lot more dense in here than um, say a lager would be or the red ale that we made before. So uh, right now I just turned on recirculation so that basically I'm pulling the wort off of the bottom that's underneath the false bottom that goes through the pump and back into the top. So my goal right now is to choose my recirculation rate. If I go too high, it's just gonna bubble up because it doesn't have time to filter out of the bottom to recirculate. So that means that I'll be running my heating elements dry, potentially. So I can do that with this simple ball valve on the side. Um, I can increase it or decrease it. And once I have that dialed in, I can basically just let that go for uh, the hour that is recommended. We're going to do an hour mash. So you do not have to. However, I do stir every once in a while. One, I'm just, I like to stay busy and feel like I'm being useful. And two, I want to give it a good um, mix every once in a while just to make sure that all the grains are being exposed to the, the flow. Uh, and I'm not channeling anything straight to the bottom. So give it a, all the chances that it can get. Exception being, I want it to kind of settle uh, for the last, I'd say, 10 or 15 minutes so that um, it's actually filtering. So the grain husks in here are acting as a filter along with the false bottom. And uh, so once those settle, they kind of just make like a mesh uh, screen. And that helps with getting, you know, any of the boogers or extra husks that are making it through. And so they kind of filter each other out. So um, I'm gonna set a timer for one hour. I'm gonna stir it every 20 minutes, but the last 20 minutes, uh, I'm gonna let it settle. Right now, I'm gonna put the lid back on. That's gonna help with heat retention and uh, basically put this hose back through uh, the lid on the top of the hole. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna let it rest and uh, mash and do its thing. Then we're gonna mash out and uh, I'll see you for that. All right, we are back. It has been one hour of mashing and I've kept an eye on the flow rate to make sure that we are not stacking liquid up above the grains. I'm giving it enough time to flow down. Um, I gave it a stir every 20 minutes and now it is time to mash out. So what I am going to do is turn off the pump first so that I don't make a giant mess. Basically, this has been my flow rate. Oop, that kinked a little bit. So this has been my flow rate that I ended up settling on. Um, this hose, I just move it around or I'll lay my mash paddle into uh, right on top of the grains and let that hose end lip uh, just kind of rest on there so that it's like spreading the liquid. There's no magic to this. The point is recirculation, um, but like we did in the brew in a bag, it's just sitting there at that temperature. There was no recirculation going on. So again, no, no magic. It's just a matter of dialing in your system to how you want to use it. Um, so I'm going to turn the pump off like so, um, let that line kind of clear so that I don't pour a bunch of hot wort all over the ground. Oh, actually there it goes. That's my timer. Um, so, uh, now I'm going to rest this on the outside take my um, handle here and put it in. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, we exercise so that you can be a proficient brewer and lift this gigantic malt pipe out of the way. We're gonna go just a little bit at a time. Never mind, we're gonna use the winch because that is freaking heavy. Stand by while I set that up. I didn't mention at the beginning of the video that this brewing system is usually gonna be used on the ground. So uh, after bragging about working out and not being able to lift a malt pipe, I am back with my um, 
trusty winch here. So I'm gonna lift and kind of just go a couple notches at a time while we relieve the liquid weight out of the malt pipe. So as we go up, I'm just gonna add the, the clicks on here. Let it rest for a second and then do some more. When this is waist high, because it's on the ground, it's much easier to get that leverage or you can have a second person help you. Again, we have kind of maxed out the ability of the system uh, with what we've got uh, with this grain bill. So um, yeah, I mean, it's heavy. It's 30 pounds of grain plus all the water weight that's in there. Let that water kind of wash down. And from here, I'm gonna grab it, and then we give it a quarter turn and rest the feet onto those, uh, the legs inside there. Just like that. Like I mentioned before we get started, we got started uh, the top screen. I'm gonna go ahead and install that right now. And uh, I'm gonna press down on the grains just enough to uh, kind of speed this process along. But before I do that, I'm gonna move over and actually turn the elements on so that we can get up to a boil. So while it's draining, it's also coming up to a boil with the temperature. So let me do that first. We just turned it up to HH, which is high, high. I'm gonna keep an eye on that so that we don't boil over as I get close to like 205. I'm gonna turn off the two outside elements, so that's the 500 and the 2000, so that we're just running on the 1000 watt setting. On a hot summer day, I can usually get away with like a nice simmer boil with uh, just the 500 watt, but uh, here we are. So again, this is the screen. I'm just gonna put it right on top of the grains and press down to get the wort that's inside those grains still to come out quicker. Again, like I said, this system is gonna be a lot more user-friendly when it's on the ground. All right, now we wait, we're gonna get up to a boil and I'm actually gonna add the rest of the water. I added just a little bit after we mashed in to make sure that there was enough. I wanted to get that balance to just under an inch from the overflow pipe uh, so that I could still stir the grains, but I also wanted it to have enough water kind of flowing around in there during the mash. So I added about half a gallon. I'm gonna put the rest in. I could sparge over the top, which means to rinse over the top of these grains but I don't think I need to do that because it's been recirculating enough and uh, we're good. So this is gonna continue to drain. I will then remove this, add the water while we wait for it to come up to a boil. So this system's pretty fast with all three elements on right now. It's probably gonna take, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes to get up to a boil, which is impressively fast. We are at a boil. Um, it, the temperature probe says 208, which is normal for it to be under. 211 is probably where it's gonna land. I'm now gonna remove the malt pipe, which is very hot. Obviously, the steam coming up is boiling. Um, so let's get to it before I need to monitor this thing for a boil over. So I grab the stick that has not been inserted the whole time, because otherwise this thing would be hot, right? So grab that on. I have the brute trash can. You know what, let me just show you. The trash can lid 
that I have for the, the runoff that I use for running off my uh, chiller water. I just put this on the ground because then I can remove the malt pipe uh, directly onto it. If there's any more drips or anything that's gonna collect here, I just hose it off later. Um, drop that right there on the ground. Grab said malt pipe. Drop it down. We are now at a boil. Uh, for this unit, I'm gonna use a hop spider. The pump is built into the base of this system, so if I did get a clogged pump, there's really nothing that I can do to take that thing apart to pull it, to pull those hops out. So I really need to kind of be careful with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this in. But like I told you earlier, so our volume now um, is just under nine gallons. I want a 10 gallon batch, so I'm gonna add uh, the rest of those three gallons of water. Um, actually, you know what? Now that I've extracted that, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna get it up to 11 gallons in the fermenter, or I'm sorry, in the brew kettle, and uh, we'll see how much volume that actually is. So this is the hop spider, I'm gonna just put it in there. I'm gonna grab the water. That was really close. So I was right, my calculations were spot on. Uh, I added about half a gallon before, just put the two and a half gallons left, and that got me to 11 gallons pre-boil. So I'm gonna actually take this chance and take a gravity reading um, and uh, show you how that part is done. And yeah, basically we're coming back up to a boil because I just added water that was not boiling. Once we're back up at a boil, I'm gonna do my first hop addition. Because this is boiling, I'm going to just let it sit in my refrigerator for like 10 or 15 minutes, but that's gonna give me the pre-boil gravity. I take that as a note, just so that I know that I'm adding the right amount of water for this. I've done this recipe enough times that I know that 13 gallons is the right amount for me uh, to end up with about uh, 11 gallons into the fermenter uh, once we're done with brew day. So pre-boil gravity is a good uh, check and, um, but you're supposed to do this at room temperature. So I'm gonna leave it in the refrigerator probably for half an hour, it'll be ready in this tube. Alternately, I can just take a tiny sample that's gonna come to room temperature pretty fast and use the refractometer. That is kind of a nice thing about the refractometer. I'm just gonna use the little squeegee and uh, we'll get our pre-boil gravity with this. We're at 1050, 1.050 pre-boil. And let's take a look at this recipe after I clean this off. The recommended uh, gravities or where we're gonna land is between 1065, 1.065 and 1.070, so 1070. This boil is gonna boil off water, which increases the sugar content, which is what we're measuring with this. So the higher the number means the higher the concentration of sugar there is, which equates to how much alcohol is going to be in the final product. So a 1050 original gravity, and I'm gonna boil off a gallon of this water in the next hour, we are right in the zone. So if it takes me one hour, that's fine. If it takes me an hour and 20 minutes, 
also fine. It's just a matter of removing the hop spider so we're not over bittering this beer. So um, we're on target right now. I am going to return this to a boil and as soon as it gets there, I can already tell we're at a sub simmer. Um, we're gonna add our first uh, boil hops and I'll see you then. Okay, so one pro tip on this note, um, a high density beer like this. So we've got the dark roast, uh, just a lot of stuff going on in the malt bill here. These are gonna be prone to boiling over. So there's a lot of headspace left in here. I have, uh, you know, I'm at the 11 uh, gallon mark and this can hold up to 17 gallons, but that foam can build up on top of itself pretty fast. So if you're not like Johnny on the spot, to turn off some of these elements or all of those elements. If you see that foam climbing up inside here, um, you're gonna wanna use firm cap. So this is a firm cap S, you're gonna see foam control drops. It's all kind of the same thing. Um, you just put a couple drops right on the top. And what this does, it's basically like an oily substance that's going to um, break the surface tension on the top. And so that lets that foam die down pretty quick. Uh, you can use this inside a fermenter or you can use it for foam control on the boil. So as I get closer, so when I'm looking at it, it's like 208 degrees, 210 degrees. That's when I drop it in and it really helps prevent a boil over, which is an absolute misery to clean up because the outside of your kettle is going to be just as dirty as the inside. And it's just going to keep getting caked on there during the boil hour. There's really nothing you can do about it. So prevention is, uh, you know, it's a good thing. So firm cap, it's like a nickel. Go buy it, it's easy. Uh, all of the links are in the description down um, with the links to all of these other kettles. So um, yeah, there's your pro tip for the day. So here we are, we have a nice rolling boil. I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna reduce the power that's being applied to this. To I'm just gonna leave it on the 2000 setting. So essentially I'm going from 3,500 watts to 2000 watts. I want a rolling boil, but I don't need it to be like bubble frothing crazy, um, going nuts. Cause of, essentially that's just driving off water and uh, I want to control that a little bit. And uh, so that's how we're going to do it. Right now, this is a good rolling boil. Let's see how it goes with 2000 watts. Immediately it dies down just a little bit, but I'm still at a healthy boil. So it did exactly what, I'm what it was supposed to do. That firm cap prevented that protein break from building up a big old head and then potentially boiling over. Um, absolute disaster, firm cap is easy and cheap insurance. So right now I'm gonna do my first hop addition. So that is two ounces of Columbus. The recipe calls for one, but like I said, we're doubling it. So I'm gonna put two ounces of Columbus. Hop additions are my kids' favorite part of the brew day. Uh, they always come in, can I put the green stuff in? Can I put the green stuff in? And so if they're out riding their scooters around the driveway while I'm in here in the brewery, um, they're always paying attention when the green packets come out because they just love it. It's part of a kind of a family thing that we do now. Oh, oh my gosh, this is so good. You just bury your nose down in there and if that doesn't make your day as a brewer, you are doing the wrong hobby. So I'm gonna go right into the hop spider. Again, I wanna protect the um, pump that's on this system. So hops always go into the spider. On the claw hammer supply with the exposed element, not so worried about it. I just dump it right in and uh, it doesn't really matter. But for this one, internal pump, I can't clean it. I can't just take it apart and clean it. So hop spider it is. Right into the spider. Um, this nice big spider, I can just jam the uh, mash paddle down into it and kind of give these a, a whirl to make sure that they're exposed to uh, the bubbling wort. And uh, that gives us maximum exposure. 
If this were, say, a hazy IPA or something where I've got, or rather, like a big old double IPA, where I've got a boatload of hops that I just added for the bitterness hop addition, so that wouldn't be a, a, a New England, that would be just like a double IPA West Coast or something like that, um, may need two hop spiders. For this particular brew, we're gonna have two ounces now, four ounces at the 15 mark. Um, I think that this one hop spider can do it. We'll, we'll judge that as we add them. Uh, you can put as many of these hop spiders or uh, just get like a nylon or one of the mesh bags that come for hop additions, drop them in there and throw them right into the boil. That works just as well. Um, the point is I don't want this thing to get all like caked up and full of hops because then the wort isn't flowing through it from the boil. Um, you can do a couple of different things to get around that. Just grab it um, and kind of like whoosh it around in there and reintegrate it, but just keep an eye on it. And uh, as long as it's kind of flowing and bubbling, you're doing fine. I will set a timer for 45 minutes. And the next time I see you, we're gonna do our 15 minute hop additions. Again, the hop calculator, the hop addition calculator works backwards. So my 60 minute hops listed on here, um, or boil hops are the beginning. The next hops are my 15 minute hops. That's not 15 minutes after the hour, that is 15 minutes remaining in the boil. So those hops that we just added are the beginning of our one hour timer. So I'm only adding 45 minutes to a timer now so that I know when I've got 15 minutes left. Those are actually gonna indicate when I am gonna put the whirl flock in there and uh, get my immersion chiller sanitized. So that kind of triggers other things that we're gonna do. But between now and then, I'm gonna prepare the fermenter for this to go in. Because once we're done with the hops and the boil, I'm gonna to wanna to transfer that to the fermenter and be done with brew day so I can set up to clean. And uh, so all of the time in between now and the next hop additions, I'm gonna be setting up the, the fermenter and getting everything else done. I can also dump the grains that we had in the uh, uh, grain basket, clean that if I want to, and kind of get ready to go on with my day. So I'll be back at the 15 minute mark. Here we are, we're at the 15 minutes left in the boil mark, and I'm about to add four ounces of Cascade. This is absolutely one of my favorite hops, and uh, as soon as you give it a smell, you're gonna know why. It's just, it, it is so good. Um, yeah, floral and citrus notes for days, which in a porter sounds odd, but as a 15 minute hop addition, it's gonna make perfect sense once you taste the final one. So four ounces here, I've already got two ounces in the other spider, so I'm gonna add a second hop spider. This is not necessary, but again, it's nice to have. So. I add that guy right in. I'm just gonna spread this out. So basically one ounce into the other one that we used, the other half into here. So the final, uh, I guess, end result is that I've got three ounces in one, three ounces in the other. So I'm gonna go right in there and give it a gentle swirl. There's our instructions. Give it a gentle swirl into both. We again have a nice rolling boil. As it ended out, um, I ended up with all three of the switches on for this boil. Um, it was not overwhelming at just the temperature of the evening, you know, with the set being open in between shots, we were able to turn those on. So um, now I'm gonna set a timer. I'm actually gonna set a timer for five minutes because I need to put the whirl flock in at the 10 minute mark. And then I'm also gonna add the chiller in uh, so that we can sanitize that before dropping it down uh, to temperature. So the heat of the boil is going to sanitize my immersion chiller. I will see you back in a second once we're ready to put that in.
All right, we are rounding the end of this brew day. It has gone magnificently so far. Uh, our boil has been rolling. We are just under 10 gallons in the boil kettle, uh, which I'm fine with because our numbers are coming out good. I just checked it and we are at 1062, which is uh, just fine for this beer. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove these hop spiders um, and because I need to fit my chilling coil in here. If I were using a plate chiller or a counterflow chiller, I would be using essentially the, the bottom spout or the pump off of this arm and pushing that work through those chillers. I like the immersion chiller. Again, I can clean the outside of it. I don't worry about anything being caught up inside of it. Um, it's, it's just a simple process. But the only downside is that when I've got hop spiders inside my boil kettle, I can't fit it in. So if they're just one, I could lift it, hold it down into the center into that. But for these, I've gotten the whole boil. We're good, we're not trying to ex extract any more hops. The only reason I'm putting this in is to sterilize it. So the temperature of the uh, boiling wort right now is going to sanitize it almost instantly. So I'm just gonna drain out the water that's in here. And uh, like in previous brew days that you've watched here, I have my brew trash can over here that's gonna collect the water runoff. That ends up in uh, my garden. So I'm gonna go water bushes with it, uh, or if it doesn't have these hop residues in it, it goes right into my pool. So obviously this one is gonna have some hop residue. So I'm just gonna hook this over the edge as soon as it's done draining, or once it gets close anyway, um, and transfer that over there. Hook it over the edge. You don't want to do this with your bare hands because this is very literally boiling. So these aroma hops, I can actually drop right down into the center of the uh, chiller here. So we're hooked up. I'm gonna get my drain line. It kind of doesn't matter which direction you go, one way or the other, um, the triple threat jaded chiller right here is uh, kind of an animal and uh, doesn't really care which side is in or out as far as I understand it. Um, she's immersed. The hops are sitting here right in the center. Uh, it's still boiling. So that is telling me that this uh, spider came up temperature right away. Obviously copper is a great heat conductor. So that is good news. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let it sit here for three or four minutes more, uh, just to make sure that we're completely sanitized with boil, and then I'm gonna kill the boil. And what that means, I'm just gonna turn those switches off. So I'll see you in a minute. We have now sanitized the immersion chiller. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on after I turn off the boil. So again, you're gonna see this on the instructions as flame out. Obviously there's no flame with electric brewing, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go boop and turn all three of those off. That uh, stops the process. So as a extra, I'm just gonna hit the pause on there and that's gonna tell the controller that I am no longer trying to get up to high power. So um, those are off. Immersion chiller is sanitized. The fermenter is sanitized and we are ready to start chilling. So all I need to do is go turn my water on and this is gonna do its thing again. I'm gonna just give it a swirl as it goes around. This thing is fully immersed, but the more surface area contact that I can get, the better. So um, to make that happen without me having to sit there and stir, I'm gonna attach the recirculation arm and turn the pump on. And it's gonna recirculate through that and uh, kind of do that work for me. So uh, here we go, we're gonna do that. Here it is, recirculation arm. Reattach the cam locks. Drop that right down. I'm gonna send it through the spider. Ooh, maybe we can get some more aroma hops out of it. Um, and extra filtration, so it's going through the spider, so everything that's pumping back through is gonna do that. Um, I'm gonna turn the water. You know what, no. Let's let it roll. While this is still 210 degrees, it's gonna sanitize instantly, so I'm gonna start the pump first, and then we're gonna turn the water on and start chilling. There's 
Here she goes. By the way, I gotta point out, in case you were wondering, this uh, hose is high temperature food grade silicone. There is uh, no flavor coming off of it. It doesn't smell like plastic. It'll never impart flavor into that. All of the hoses in my brewery are this high grade, um, food grade silicone. So uh, any of the brewing equipment that you're gonna get from any of the reputable vendors um, are gonna come with that. You don't have to worry about it. You would not, however, wanna just go to Lowe's and get any hose that fits. Those are not food grade um, and they will impart plastic or rubber flavors into your beer and you definitely do not want. So uh, just thought I'd let you know. This first shot of water that comes out of the chiller. Is really, really hot, so be careful. Um, a lot of home brewers use a hose as the output and that hose is gonna be chilling in the backyard. If you've got kids or animals running around, make sure that that area is clear because out of this copper chiller, it's gonna be literally boiling as it comes out. So. Uh, I'm gonna be keeping an eye on this. Obviously, it's completely enclosed into this system, so I know what's happening, but just please be careful. Animals, kids, uh, spouses, whatever, just be careful because that output water is going to be literally boiling and it'll burn somebody. Right now, we are recirculating with the pump that is built into the Brusilla. It makes life pretty nice. Um, otherwise, I would be stirring and kind of getting contact area on there. But even just grabbing this copper pipe right now would burn my hands because it's 212 degrees or more. So um, this side is safe because that's a water input. So that is groundwater temperature um, and it's fine. It's running through the wort and uh, doing its thing. But the output, that's still really hot. So let's give this a minute as it, uh, fills this brute trash can, um, we're just gonna let it rest and give it a minute to chill. All right, we are at 140 degrees. My runoff trash can is full. So instead of uh, going and draining this somewhere and then starting back over, I'm just gonna go ahead and remove this chiller. Put him right into that bucket. I really like that technique because that hot water in there is gonna just start cleaning it so that once I'm ready and I get to the cleaning of that part, it's already been soaking for a little while. So um, that's done. I'm gonna do what is called, um, so a partial no-chill. A no-chill uh, would be technically putting the boiling hot wort into say a cube or your fermenting vessel and letting it sit until it cools down to room temperature or rather pitching temperature. So um, I'm doing a partial. So I did my bucket full of water, but I'm still at 140 because my groundwater temperature is pretty high. Um, I could just let this keep going, but it's kind of a law of diminishing return. So I'm at 140. I'm gonna go ahead and transfer it to the fermenter. I have glycol control. So with the cool stick, I'm gonna drop this down and turn on glycol and let it run and overnight, it's gonna get it to 68, no problem at all. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. An alternate method would be if you have a refrigerator or uh, that's what you're using as your fermentation control, you set it to whatever temperature you wanna ferment at and let it just let it go until it's ready and then you pitch your yeast. So. I'm certain that by tomorrow morning, I am gonna be good. The only thing that you need to take into account if you're doing the no-chill method is the volume of liquid is literally going to shrink as it drops in temperature. So I'm not gonna seal it off with a pressure gauge or anything. I'm gonna leave it open with just a towel laying over the port. Folks, Look, I know we're getting into the area of everybody saying like, oh, what about bacterial contamination or like air yeast or whatever taking over. 12 hours with a towel over the port is gonna let the, the volume uh, displacement to, you know, it's gonna pull in that little amount of, uh, of air. It's really not that big of a deal. The odds of you getting an infection are pretty low if you've sanitized everything as well as we have up until now. 
So you just don't need to worry about it. Um, there are plenty of folks out there doing open fermentations, which means like cheesecloth over it so like a fly can't land in it. Um, you're gonna be fine. Don't panic, it's just homebrew um, and roll with it. So um, I'm gonna start the pump on this. The Bruzilla has its super nifty pump. I've been recirculating super hot work during the chilling through this so I know that it's sanitized. I just put the hose from inside the bucket where I was recirculating into the fermenter that we have sanitized during the boil and it's as easy as hitting a switch. That is our transfer. There she goes. Again, we're back to this aeration conversation. Some folks are gonna wanna get uh, oxygen aerating in it. I personally don't have, um, I don't think that that's necessary. I just have never seen any benefit come out of a batch that I did, that I did use oxygen aeration versus not. And so again, that's like, you can either have a oxygen stone at the end. Oh, here, let me just show you. So this is what that looks like. Um, the oxygen is a red canister like this. You attach your regulator onto the end. Fun fact, oxygen fat, oxygen uh, threads run counter to the norm. So that's how you know you're not attaching like uh, propane to this, for example. So here's our uh, aeration stone. That is a little bitty carb stone at the end of a carbing wand. So essentially all we're gonna do once we transfer this word in here is sanitize this, put it in and turn the oxygen on. That's just gonna inject oxygen in here. So for the case, for this, uh, this course, I'm just gonna show you what that looks like. For now, I'm gonna wait until the uh, transfer is complete. Um, you don't wanna touch the carb stone. The oils on your fingers can clog those teeny tiny pores. Um, I'm gonna sanitize it before I drop it in there. The best way to do that is to put that, plunge that all the way into a bucket of sanitizer and do that. I'm just gonna spray the outside because I know that I've, uh, I've always kept it clean. So for now, we're just gonna keep transferring. My only way of oxygenating is the splashy splashy. So if you've got a pump, you're doing this, it's frothing up as it goes in. Um, again, it's just not a thing you need to worry about. Although we're above temperature, I'm gonna take a sample here. Ten sixty five on the money. Very happy with how this turned out. The numbers match. This is going to be uh, six and a half or seven percent beer. All right. So for the sake of showing you what the carb stone oxygen tank thing looks like, again. I don't usually do this, but if you want to, go for it. I'm gonna sanitize the wand. And the stone itself. Then we just plunge it right down into our wort and turn it on. It's gonna look like a mini boil but essentially that carb stone is injecting oxygen into the wort. And uh, again, that oxygen is important for cell wall multiplication for the yeast. But um, again, in my experience, it's just not that important a step on the home brewing scale. We don't have to deal with things like osmotic pressure from a 350 gallon tank that is cone shaped. Um, 
It's just not something we need to worry about. We're gonna go ahead and sanitize the lid now. Don't fear the foam. When it comes to star sand, uh, it's not gonna affect the final flavor. It is a, uh, it is the easiest, cheapest insurance you can possibly have. This kind of lid seal essentially clamps down on that rubber gasket that goes around the edge. That's how you get it to be uh, essentially pressurizable. We can go up to 12 PSI safely. This pressure release valve will release at 15 PSI, um, which means it's, you know, we're still in safe ranges, but at 12 with a spunding valve, I could carbonate this beer as it ferments using its own generated CO2. We're gonna crank that guy down. Next, we've got the lid. One of the coolest things about this fermenter, uh, or I guess new fermenters coming out, is the floating dip tube. So I'm also gonna sanitize it. Essentially, as it's fermenting, this ball keeps that, uh, the end of this dip tube up at the top of the wort. So when I go to transfer out, I'm not reliant on dumping all of the tube out of the bottom, which is an option with this, but I can also just leave it. And when I go to transfer, I just do it straight out of this and uh, I'm pulling from the top. So that gives me the cleanest wort possible. This is also nice inside of fermenters. So, I'm sorry, inside of the kegs that you're dispensing out of. So you're, get the, you're getting the cleanest beer possible when the uh, other stuff like the yeast or any you know, kind of hop residue has settled to the bottom of the tank. So I'm gonna set that down, sanitize this as well. We're looking for the beer outspout, which is the long one. Slide that on. My hands are sanitized, so we are good. I'm just gonna drop that right into the tap. Next step is the cool stick. Essentially what's going on inside of this is that there's a coil that goes around the outside and then a return that goes up the middle. That glycol is gonna go down getting as much surface area as it can around the outside of this uh, in contact with the beer. And that is going to pull that heat out through that center coil. So, um, these are okay in a hot summer month here in California. Um, they do have a hard time keeping up with 115 degree heat and they are not designed to cold crash. If you wanna get down to 34 degrees or 33 degrees, you're simply not gonna do with this. You need one of the coil chillers that goes down inside. However, when it comes to just fermentation temperature control within a 10 plus or 10 minus uh, range, these guys get the job done and they are infinitely easier to clean than the coil. So pro and con that uh, ought to help guide your buying decision. So that's our last tri clamp. So I'm gonna go hook this up. I'm literally gonna lay this towel over the final port right there. 
So the open guy on the far side, this one here, um, I'm gonna lay a towel over it so no flies or anything get in there. And tomorrow morning, so in uh, eight hours, I'm gonna come out and this beer will be at 68 degrees because the glycol will have been hooked up. And uh, I'm gonna pitch my yeast. For this one, I'm gonna use Imperial House. And uh, if you don't have access to Imperial, you wanna try something else, I highly recommend San Diego Super Yeast. That is uh, one, of, one of my favorites on this, kind of gives it more of a, a floral thing going on. Um, it's gonna be ready, and, uh, but this is where I'm gonna hook up my blow off tube. So once the yeast is pitched, that carbon dioxide is gonna start building up and it wants to go somewhere. So I can take that blow off tube and either connect it to a keg filled with sanitizer that's gonna again then push that sanitizer out, cleaning the keg that this is going, that this beer is gonna end up in, or uh, just run that line into a bucket or a jar of sanitizer um, so that nothing can get back in, only uh, carbon dioxide can get out. So that's it. That's a complete brew day for a porter. And I hope you learned everything that you need to know to use the Brewzilla and then transfer into a stainless steel um, fermenter. Obviously, this could go into two different plastic buckets. We've talked about fermenting uh, methods before. This is the exact setup that I use when I do this recipe and uh, pretty proud of it. Comes out time over time and I really love making this beer.